Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Clinic Gym Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Satterley, and it's my pleasure today to be joined by Mike Perry. Mike, how's it going, buddy? I'm great, Josh. How are you? I'm great. Can you give me an idea of uh, where your, your facility is and what kind of the day-to-day operation of it looks like? Okay, so I own a gym in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. We are about 35 miles west of Boston, but okay. pretty much right on the uh, New Hampshire line. And, you know, our specialty is adult group training, uh, you know, personal training, one-on-one training. Um, we do work with athletes as well. We've got high school and collegiate programs. Um, we do a lot of work with combat athletes. And recently we started working with a local hospital to integrate physical therapy and training and, and really try to develop a bridging the gap program so clients can come off of physical therapy and go right into the gym and, and put themselves in a tri- in a smart training environment. I love it. So even the hospital is recognizing that like after therapy is done, you don't just stop. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things that um, it's it's been my dream to have a direct pipeline with some local physicians and you know, it took six years for it to finally happen, but we're actually getting to a point where we're getting referrals from local orthopedic surgeons and doctors. And that's a mm. pretty fantastic referral. And it's something that we take a lot of pride in when, you know, a local doctor is like, Hey, you know, after you do your, uh, your PT, you know, head over to SOS and, and Mike and those guys, and they're going to take care of you. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing how far we've come. Um, when, when doctors and physicians have the trust in your skill set and your ability, um, you know, I would say that says a lot about what we're doing and uh, what we're trying to do with our clientele. I love it. Yeah. And can you give every a little, I think you got one of them. I certainly think it's one of the most beautiful facilities around um, because it's not a sterile training environment, you know, like you've got some big old wood posts in the middle of it and stuff, but can you give any idea about the actual facility? Like how many coaches, how many square feet, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So we've got about 5,500 square feet. Our facility is in an old mill building and um, it's an interesting story. I mean, obviously the mill building has been around for, you know, I don't know exactly over a hundred years and um, it's been renovated a few times. And at one point, uh, I don't know who the developer was, but they just, I mean, they literally took everything down and apart and just like, rebuilt and redid everything. And, uh, it's a lot of brick. It's a lot of exposed wood and it's got a really, really nice feel to it. And, um, you know, that is one of the things that I think people, when they come into our facility, they just look around and they're like, wow, this is a, you know, a beautiful, beautiful facility. It's got some, uh, charisma to it, but also from a training standpoint, I mean, we've just got all the goodies as well. I think we do a good job at utilizing the space. So, um, you know, it's, it's a nice layout and, uh, we're definitely spoiled. Uh, we always get a lot of compliments on our facility. <coughs> as far as coaches go, we have, uh, let's see, as far as full-time, we've got three, three full-time and four part-time employees, actually five part-time employees. And that's pretty much how we run it. Um, nice. Yeah, it keeps us busy. Uh, but at the same time, we're trying to make sure that when we grow, it's an appropriate growth and that we can deliver the same product as we grow. Mm-hmm. Um, if 100 people came through the door tomorrow, man, I wouldn't know what to do, to be honest with you, because I don't think we could service them the way that we have in the beginning. And I want to make sure that with that growth, the quality doesn't change. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So are most of your coaches, uh, so for those people who are listening, a lot of them are clinicians and they haven't yet run fitness classes. So they haven't really seen how it goes. And, um, a lot of the people I talk to are still used to the model they see in like a 24 hour fitness where it's big room full of equipment, no, no expertise. And obviously yours is a lot more about the expertise because let's be honest, like the small gym owner will never win the side, the, the square footage or the equipment war. And so don't even enter it. Right. Cause it's, it's guaranteed go with expertise and knowledge rather than anything else. Um, but Anyway, so your full-time staff, are they, uh, are they doing classes? Are they doing one-on-ones, a mixture of? What is it, what's the setup there? Honestly, they're, they're, I tell my young coaches to train everybody and, and, and anybody because I feel like there's always something learned from each individual. So it's a combination of adult group training classes, uh, private one-on-one sessions, um, sports performance uh, you know, training for our high school athletes. Yeah. Um, even some of those guys will work directly with the physical therapists to make sure that, you know, when they're coming off of PT, that they're, they're doing the right thing. So I really try to get all of my 
all of my employees to have the experience to train everybody that they can, because there's always an opportunity to learn. And that's really important to development and growth. I love it. So, uh, so along those lines, I know that, um, you know, you teach for FMS and you're well-skilled in the functional movement systems and you're also a skilled trainer and you've kind of married those two skill sets. Like, you know, it, but there's often this thought that once you evaluate people that their program will look like, I call it rehab aside, like it's, you know, you see these trainers that don't offer a great workout and, but instead are doing corrective after corrective after corrective. And it's like, at some point, those correctives actually have to correct things. You got to move on, you know? So what, what have you learned along the way to not allow the training to fall into something that the client doesn't really want, which is sometimes too easy? Well, I think oftentimes you, you obviously have to have a good baseline and a good evaluation uh-huh. system. Obviously teaching for FMS, um, that is our baseline. But, you know, I think the first thing that you have to, you have to really explain to your clientele is that, hey, there's a few things that we want to focus on to improve mm-hmm. movement quality, uh, et cetera. But that is just a, you know, a short stint. And that is just something that hopefully we're going to spend, you know, a few weeks or a month on, and then boom, we're going to go into some actual strength training, some actual metabolic conditioning, some core training. So oftentimes, let's say someone comes in and they have an ankle injury or lower limb issue that they're, you know, in the process of, you know, working on and, re- and doing rehab on, um, man, upper body, as long as they're moving well, upper body's game. So that's a great opportunity to spend a lot of time strengthening their upper body, strengthening their core. Um, we do this a lot with, with people with any type of injuries. I would say the biggest surprise that people have is like when we get our ACL rehab clients where they come in and, you know, yeah, we're doing the basic stuff. We're going to do our mini band stuff and there's nothing wrong with some basic activation drills, but you better believe they're going to be doing pull-ups, bench press, core work. They're going to be doing all those other things to get them strong as well. So when people come in and they, they want to rehabilitate an injury or work on correctives. Um, yeah, that's obviously part of the plan, but if you're spending an hour doing, you know, mini band walks and, you know, really silly kind of foofy, uh, corrective exercises, you're wasting time. So I, I do think that there's a time and a place for those correctives, but you know, you have to look at your program and if you're not making some sort of change within the first you know, few weeks, you're not, you're either hitting the wrong thing or you're not doing a good job, or there's an underlying issue that you're not prepared to take on. And you should make sure that you reach out to a clinician or a medical professional so they can maybe take a look because, you know, sometimes there's, there's just scenarios that need some hands-on work and they need a skilled clinician to take care of those things. So, um, corrective exercise, man, I, I hate it. And, and, and I make a living doing it. So it's one of those things where um, it just, I even hate the term because people automatically think, um, okay, corrective exercise, we're going to be doing like bird dogs, mini band walks, and, you know, uh, pull off presses like for the rest of our life. And those are cool things. But at the same time, we got to learn the basics, right? And I'm a huge fan of just implementing smart training progressions. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you're going to, you know, squatting, if you want to squat, everybody's going to squat sooner or later, right? Whether you, you know, your goal is to, you know, I don't know, pick something up, pick something up off of the ground or, you know, having the ability to use the bathroom by yourself, that's a squat pattern. So why wouldn't we just train it in an efficient way? Not only are you going to be functional, but you are going to get stronger in the process. So um, I try to educate people on the fact that, Hey, listen, what we're trying to do is we're trying to improve your quality of life. We're, we're trying to improve function. And when we nail those movement patterns down, you're going to get stronger. You're going to get more durable. And they're obviously going to be the aesthetic components uh, that come along with it. So, um, you know, I, I really believe in, in really mastering the fundamentals, but do, do your correctives and fix them and then move on and put together a smart quality strength and conditioning program. And then I think you're going to see a ton of results. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of an analogy. I've been trying to think about this for years, probably. But I think corrective exercise is, is the salt in a really good meal. Like it should be sprinkled in. And I've never had a meal where there was no salt. I'm, I'm sure there could be one, but you know, it's sprinkled in, but you would never serve a plate of salt to somebody and call it a meal. Like you still need the meat, which is the very good strength progressions, you know. And if you're a good enough coach, your progressions and regressions list is so long that that almost nobody fits along that spectrum at some point, even if they are, you know, five days post ACL surgery, it's like, great. What about their, you know, up, like you said, upper body is there's no restrictions there. 
and uh, and there's quite a quite a bit you can do. So I don't know. I don't know if that analogy holds up, but that that's my thought, you know. And, and a lot of people just go so crazy with an hour of, like you said, mini band walks and and glute activation drills. And it's like, dude, come on. There's so much more than that. Well, you know, what I found with correctives and over time, and, and obviously Grace talked about this is, you know, I try to put people in environments where the environment and the exercise will help dictate the outcome. And I, I, I definitely believe that a lot of people overcoach. I think that people are always like, you know, do this and do this and do this and do this and do this. And next thing you know, you gave them 75 cues and they're looking at you like, what the hell are you talking about? But oftentimes if you just put them in the right position, let them feel it out and let them, let them figure it out. Um, let them struggle a little bit and not in a bad way, but in a, in a, in a learning way. And, um, I think that takes care of a lot. Um, I think over the years I'm doing less and less correctives and just more and more simple, simple, smart training and letting people figure it out. And, um, less Good coaching is corrective, right? Like, <laughs> like that's part of it. And coaching is not always, you know, coaching is making sure there's an opportunity to learn and learning means that they know how to do the exercise themselves, which that may be a progressive corrective strategy there to they actually perform a really good, you know, forward lunge or something, whatever's on your, your, your exercise. It's yeah. I'm glad you're bringing that up because I think that a lot of people forget that that is the end goal is that the client is doing it, not you. Yeah. And I think oftentimes there's this sort of paralysis by analysis, right? So, I mean, you know, obviously we speak the same language with, you know, the SFMA and FMS, but people always talk about, is it a motor control issue? Is it a, is it a, you know, it's a, is it a mobility issue? Is it a this? And it's like, the answer is yes. It's, it's probably all of those combined, but um, I think we just confuse ourselves oftentimes. And, and if we can just get people to just start just moving and getting in the right positions and understanding how to move your body in space, um, good things will happen. I spent a lot of time recently um, just really targeting really, really simple stuff um, and call it motor control, call it whatever you want. But, um, you know, just teaching people the basics and, and what I've figured out is like, man, if you can get a client early on to understand just how to move their pelvis independently of the rest of their body, how to extend their thoracic spine, uh, you know, without moving the rest of their body, if I can get those people to do those things and understand how to, you know, move their pelvis here, extend the thoracic spine here, put the rib cage here, everything else gets easier. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that I've spent a ton of time on. You call it, you know, core training if you want. Um, but if I'm finding that if I can get those things done as quickly as possible, the other stuff is fluff. The other stuff is super easy. So that's where I'm actually spending a lot of my time is just finding those, those really early postures and just mm -hmm. teaching them and hammering them and then squatting, lunging, everything else on top of it is, is cake. And, uh, those are one of the things that I've, I've really focused on recently and it's fixed and it's helped a lot of people because if they can understand those big rocks, everything else gets a lot easier. And, um, does that hold up true in your, your, prof so let's take two totally disparate groups, like your professional MMA fighters. I know you have some guys fighting in the UFC, so that's the highest, that's the peak of their sport, right? They're at the highest level you can attain in their sport. And then you're talking about getting referrals from PD, PT departments and orthos. Mm -hmm. so those are people that currently have in injuries. Do those two skill sets, are they effective for both groups? Absolutely. Wow. Because one of the things you have to understand is that um, first you get to find someone's starting point, someone's appropriate starting point. Mm -hmm. And with professional athletes, while they may be a professional in their given sport, it doesn't mean that they're a professional in the weight room. It doesn't mean that their training age is very, very high. So oftentimes, just their, through, through practice and genetics and, and all the things they've done before that, they've, that's got them to a certain point. That doesn't mean that they're going to back squat well. You know? And that's one of the things people have to understand is you can't assume because someone is an incredibly high-level athlete that they're good at something, but you can't assume just because someone's coming out of a rehab scenario that they're incredibly weak and fragile and they're not durable, right? So I think you have that's to really... Good point, man. I think that gets overlooked. I think you have to really give people the opportunity to uh, show you what they've got and also to show you what they don't have because there's been times, man, and, and I'm sure you've done this. I, I mean, put, someone walks in the door and I'm like, e you know, what is this going to look like? And, you know, you know, they, they, you're just thinking, man, this guy's not going to move well, or this woman's not going to move well. And all of a sudden they bang out a three in the deep squat and you're like, what the heck? So I, I think you, you oftentimes have to give 
the people the opportunity to show you what they're they're uh, capable of doing. And man, he, human beings are not as fragile as as people say they are. And um, you know, they're going to come in, and if they're motivated, they're going to come in and work hard. So I think that's an important part of of the rehab component. At least what I'm doing. If I come in, and you know, there's some people ready to work. So uh, you can't judge a book by its cover. And, and, uh, and in I'll case. tell you the two most surprising things I've ever seen in my life, and I'd love to hear yours because. I think a, there's there's this whole group on Facebook that's like, oh, the FMS isn't good, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, these these keyboard warriors that talk all the smack about it. And, you know, I think part of it is just ask people to perform the different movements that you might ask them to do in your gym and look at what they look like because you will be surprised. And so uh, the two things, I don't, do you know who Shane Hammond is? He was a uh, competing in the U.S. in the 105 kilo plus Olympic weightlifting he went to Athens. He's, he's a huge man, a huge man. He's five foot 11, probably at competition times weighs 360. And uh, dude can move some weight. Anyways, I happen to be at the Olympic Training Center driving through. And uh, you got this big, I mean, he looks like a big fat dude. Two-handed reverse dunks of basketball. I mean, yes. just drops into it two steps and he is just, I mean, you're like that much mass should not move up and down like that. But you know, when he's used to putting 500 you know, pounds over his head, it's amazing what your body can do when you just let it loose. Mm-hmm. So I was blown away by that. And that's my don't assume. And then to your point, one of the best squats I've ever seen in my life that just blew me out of the water I was doing the SFMA with a woman who was 83 years old. And I said, can you put your arms up like this and just squat down? She's like, what do you mean? I said, just squat down. And she puts her arms up and they're not going into, you know, 170 degrees of shoulder flexion. Like they're, she's kind of tight. She drops into what was almost like the most perfect squat. If her arm position was a little bit better, would have been, they would have put it on the cover of a freaking manual. It was so perfect. And then she stands up, she goes, huh, I haven't done that in 25 years. I'm like, (laughs) that's why we do this, right? Like you don't know, like there's nothing to chase there when she's talking about everything else, but I, what are your most surprised? What, where have you been surprised before? So um, I'll tell you one story. A good friend of mine played in the NFL for uh, 11 years. And uh, he was just uh, after his first contract, maybe his second contract, he wasn't sure if he was going to re-up. And so he was kind of in limbo. And he's like, hey, can you come down and work with me? I'm like, absolutely. I'm like, well, let me screen you. And he's a you know offensive lineman, you know, 320 pounds, 6'4". And I'm like, all right, like I'm thinking he's not going to move well. And sure enough, I asked him to do a deep squat and he dunks a three, like first rep. And I was like, hmm. And then I walk him through the rest of the FMS. And uh, I think it was like a 19. Like he just, just crushed it. And I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, but I mean, you know, the guy did some smart training over the years. He was, uh, played in five Super Bowls, uh, has three Pro Bowls. Holy he's smokes. Yeah. Day, so, um, you know, that was something that, um, that was something that I was like, wow, that was a pretty impressive story. And then uh, another funny story. This isn't so much, actually, this is uh, more of a, you know, a screening, but also a strength story. Um, so when I first started training uh, MMA fighters, um, my first full-time client was a guy named Rob Font. He came to me, uh, he was a four in one pro and he came to me, he's, he did a little bit of strength and conditioning, but not a whole heck of a lot. And uh, so he comes in and, and I do his whole eval stuff. And there's some stuff that he can and can't do. And he, you know, we take him through some basics. So he, he, he scored decent enough where we could start training. And then we're just doing some baseline testing on his strength just to kind of see where he's at. Mm-hmm. So he's over there and he bangs out his pull-ups and he gets like seven or eight, right? And my wife's at the gym at the time. And my wife had just finished uh, Pavel's uh, fighter pull-up program. And actually, Pavel references my wife in the Tim Ferriss uh, podcast that he did. So my wife at that point was doing 14 strict dead hang tactical pull-ups. So he's over there, like, did a seven, and my wife's over there just banging out reps. And he's like, he's like, what is she training for? So it's my wife, man. She just, he's like, he just shakes his head and puts his head down. So here we have this, like, pro MMA fighter that banged out, like, maybe, maybe seven or eight reps. And then, um, you know, my wife's over there, like, doing double. So that was a pretty funny story. But now Rob is in the UFC, and he's number, uh, he's ranked number 11 in the world in the Bantamweight division. So um, it's kind of cool to see his progress and, uh, and go from there. So, but again, here's a guy that he was a pro fighter. And, you know, he, he really didn't have any weight room experience, but he was still a professional fighter. So you yeah. would think, automatically people think, Oh, he's a fighter. He must be able to do 
do crazy workouts and we should kill him. And I'm like, no, he's actually kind of weak. Like we got to fix that stuff. And the flip side is often true as well, where you got a superstar in the gym who can't do crap on the field of play, right? Like they're, they're, those aren't perfectly correlated, right? They're. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have guys that, you know, in the weight room and in the strength and conditioning world, they're killers. And I'm like, dude, like, I can't help you. You just like, you just stink at your sport. (laughs) I I mean, I don't say that to him, but like, you know, I'm thinking that to myself. I'm like, listen, like, you know, you deadlift 500, you squat 400, you can, your conditioning's through the roof. You just think at your sport. Like, yeah. and we don't need to be in the weight room anymore. Like you need we had to- a kid come in and he's like, I want to go out on, on uh, web.com with, for golf, which is kind of like the uh, minor leagues of golf. Right. And it's like, what are you currently like? What's your current handicap? He's like, eh, scratch. Now in the world of golf, like scratch is like saying I'm a, purple belt jujitsu i mean it's like there's dime a dozen now you know it used to be incredible that but now it's dime a dozen so he's scratched he's got to improve by probably five strokes which is really hard right but what we always hope for is that they came in and it's like if i'm playing scratch but i've got this massive limitation in my hips or my wrists are totally jacked up or i'm just totally out of shape it's like well there there might be a few strokes hiding in there you know so we take them through the sfma it's 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 a freaking clinic on how to perform the moves. I mean, everything looks fine. Everything looks perfect. Range of motion is great. Stability is great. It's like, all right, well, hopefully we find a big deficiency here in the gym. Take him into the gym, do our strength testing, power testing, uh, and his kinematic sequence. And it was like, everything was good. And it's like, dude, I got bad news. You, <laughs> you just got to get better at golf. Like, you're in great shape. You got no medical issues. You know, your power numbers are good. Your sequence is good. You just suck. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and that's, but, but that's honestly, but you would have never known that if you didn't take the time to do right. yeah. the evaluation and et cetera, but also just being honest with people. Um, I think people are waiting for the, uh, you know, the magic thing, like, Oh, if I hire this person, it's going to be good. Or if I hire this person, it's going to be good. But if you can just take really at a, a, take a step back and take a look at people's abilities, overall abilities and give them an honest answer, that's it. It's like, man, you just need to get better at golf. Right. I mean, that's just what it boils down to. Yeah. It's like oftentimes in a, <laughs> I remember when I was in college that the, uh, the strength coach there, Brett Tedsbury would say, you know, you, you just got to get your legs stronger. And it's like, that was the keystone to everything. But you know, these guys would come from junior, junior college transfers that could bench, we had a kid that could bench like 485 for three or something. And, uh, and watching him squat 135 was like, it was uncomfortable to watch. Like it was not a good quality movement. And you're like, He's like, you just got to get your legs stronger. So it's always funny when there's just certain keystones to, to sports or activities that uh, just you don't know until you ask. You know, here we this guy's got a 485 bench and we're like, oh, so he's probably strong in his legs. And it's like, no, he's the weakest person in our weight room with legs. And uh, yeah, it's just it's hilarious how you don't know until you, you test it. Yeah, you got you got to do your due diligence and, and take people through that. And uh and then oftentimes I have to tell my MMA guys specifically like, Hey, you know, he's good here. You just like, I think we maybe should drop his strength and conditioning by a day. And maybe he needs to spend that other day training jujitsu or wrestling. Like that's mm-hmm. the stuff that we always have to talk about because, um, you know, you got to put your ego aside and now someone comes in and, you know, they can't do a pull up and you know, if maybe they can't even do a push up. Yeah. Then there's, there's a ton of room for improvement. You just have your wife crush them, crush their ego, right? And it's like, hey, why don't you uh, pull ups next to that lady right there? She's she's okay. She, she does that for you. a lot of people, and uh, she's incredibly humble. She just like goes in the corner and does her own thing, and people are like, "What's she training for?" She, everybody, what's she training for? Yeah, there is nothing more effective at motivating people to do to increase their intensity than a uh, non nondescript, non flashy, you know, forty year old to the best is like a a young 50, 53 year old woman who's in good shape and, but doesn't look like she's anything amazing that doesn't wear bright clothes, have her rep out pull-ups and squats and, you know, split squats. I wish I could install that in every gym in America. Right. Cause all of a sudden guys would come in be like, I don't know about signing up. And then they'd look over and be like, did she just do 10 pull-ups? Yeah. Well, okay. I'll sign up. Cause I want to be able to do 15. It's like, well, <laughs> you better hustle. Cause she's on her way to 15 as well, pal. Yeah. And, 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 you know, to boot, those are, those are the ones that tend to be the most consistent and put the work in and they, 
they listen to their coach and they're coachable and they're here three to four days a week and they don't, you know, they're never giving you any crap and they're just going in there. They're, they're just doing their job and it's not flashy and it's oftentimes incredibly boring, but the proof's in the pudding. They, they're they good. And you know what? They're the best clients because they're there 12 months out of the year. They're not going out on tour for, you know, six to 12 months. Uh, they're not leaving. They're not in and out or they don't need miracles. They just want consistent training every day instead of like, you know, I got a competition coming up in, in two months and I got to get stronger. It's like, that's a tight timeline, buddy. Like, you know, I don't know if we can help you out there. Yeah. Yeah. Th- th- those are the best cases. And they're often the, um, they're, the, they're your best customers and, and, uh, you know, they come in, they, they do their training. They never argue about payment. It's, it, you know, and those are the ones that probably tend to get the least amount of attention. Whereas the pain in the butts are the ones that actually get the most amount of attention because they're just a pain in the butt and they want attention. So that's, another oh, yeah. dollar for dollar. You're making a ton more with the, the, the housewife who's 46 years old than you are with the professional anything, right? Yeah, absolutely. Are you a chiropractor or physical therapist working long hours, worrying about lower repayments and missing out on quality time with your family? You can double your income without working more hours by adding a gym to your practice. Clinic Gym Hybrid Solutions has a step-by-step guide that dramatically simplifies and speeds up the addition of a fitness center and its monthly recurring revenue. In just six months, you can be on your way to freedom. Visit clinicgymhybrid.com today for a free downloadable PDF and complimentary consultation to get you started. That's clinicgymhybrid.com. Would you mind diving into some business tips for people as they kind of start? I mean, how long you, you had your own facility here? Uh, so we have been here, uh, six and a half years. Perfect. Okay. Um, we started our business, um, out of our home, um, actually about seven and a half years ago. And we were, we were moving at the time. We had a small little condo near Boston and we decided that we were going to move out and, you know, move away from the city. And, uh, we were looking at houses and we went to this new house and, um, the way that it was set up, it was on a slight hill and it had a, uh, had a basement with 10 foot ceilings. Ooh. And I was like, we could fit a squat rack in here. <laughs> like that was literally one of the selling points for us. So, um, you know, we did that and, uh, we built the business from there and just, you know, did some local networking groups and finally get to the point where, uh, you know, we were able to, uh, move into our current facility. We started out with 3,200 square feet and after about a year and a half, we needed more. So we expanded and almost doubled in size. Yeah. In this, did you just push one wall out or did you have to totally physically move the space? No, no, we were able to just knock a wall down and expand and add on, which was, which is fantastic. So, um, that was, uh, that was nice. And as far as, you know, business tips, um, I, I guess the, the things that I would really focus on is figure out what your product is and make sure that you over deliver with whatever that product is. So if it's going to be like one-on-one training, just make sure you're doing everything you can to keep your one-on-one training clients happy. If it's going to be group training, give people the best group training experience that you know how to give mm-hmm. them. Okay. Because oftentimes people try to give someone when they first start, they try to give someone in a group a personal training experience. And eventually what's going to happen is as you grow, you're not going to be able to do that. It's just impossible. And that's one of the mistakes we made is when we started, we were so good at being on everybody. We were almost over delivering in a way and over delivering um, is not a bad thing, but what was happening is, you know, we had, you know, we'd have small groups of three or four people and we could come in and we could screen them and give them correctives and we could give them, everything. But once we started growing, we realized, wow, this, this approach is awesome for small group training and one-on-one training, but for larger group training, when you have 12 to 15 people, it's just something that you cannot do. So you have to change your approach to make sure that whatever product you're giving them, it's appropriate. And obviously from a price point, it's appropriate as well. So that's something that we kind of learned the hard way is whatever it is you're going to give someone, make sure that you can replicate it Make sure that you're not spending too much time on whatever it is you're doing and just make sure that each product is very, very different and, but it's also good at whatever it is, right? I mean, if you go, you're not going to go to McDonald's and get a filet, right? It's just not, it's not going to work like that. So that, that's the, the, one of the things that we, we figured out early on is we need to have um, sort of clear, distinct product offerings and just to make sure that we do a nice job with whatever that offering is and, and over delivering within that offering. If it's going to be group training, we're going to give them the best group training we can. It's not personal training though. And that's okay. And we always have to really, um, you know, educate our, our potential customers on that. 
mm-hmm. because um, it's it's very important that people understand what they're getting. And I think during the the you know consultation and sales process, we we try to do a good job at that. Mm-hmm. Um, another business approach I would say is make it simple. Give people only a couple options. Um, when we started, we, you know, tried to be like, we're going to give them this program. We're going to give them a mobility program and blah, blah, blah. And we realized, well, if you, if you give someone five options, they may not even pick one, Mm -hmm. but if you give them option A and option B, which is your two options, they're more apt to just pick one because it's less confusing. And, uh, how many, how many membership levels do you have? I mean, you have large group, small group and individual. It sounds like have that right. That's it. And then is there a time per week or it's just, Hey, it's one, one price per whichever you so choose. For our, our adult group training program, uh, we have a short term membership and a long term membership. Long term membership is a year. Short term membership is you have an initial three month commitment. And then after that three months, it just goes a month at a time. So, but that's all unlimited. You okay. can train as many days as you want. Um, and we found that that works for people, uh, pretty well. And, um, the average person we, t- we say, Hey, the sweet spots three days a week, like three to four days a week. That's where yeah. you need to be for it to, for it to happen. And then personal training is, you know, the old 10 pack, 20 pack, 30 pack. Um, you know, a lot of people say, you know, personal training is dead. Um, I disagree because if you're in a rehab setting and you're getting referrals from local clinicians, you can't work with them in a small group setting, at least not initially, maybe a few months down the road when they know how to do things. Yes. But when you're getting someone that's maybe even currently in, uh, you know, physical therapy, um, or just getting done with, they're going to need some one-on-one attention. Yeah. Yep. That's uh, that fits our model pretty well. Like we look, we always recommend doing small group training because most of the guys, they're not guys, but most of the people listening are, you know, they have a clinic and so they have like an extra two to 500 square feet that they're kind of converting to some fitness. Mm-hmm. And, um, but you know, along those lines do a little bit of, we, we say about four one-on-one sessions, because if, if it takes you more than four, they probably should have stayed in the clinic a little longer. If it takes you less than four, then you did a good job as a trainer, getting them into a small group. And then small group is kind of, that allows the excitement of being around other humans with, compared with great training uh, ability to coach instead of like large group where like you're saying, it kind of falls off, you know, it, it, they get brushed over, but, uh, and most of the people listening don't have the, the, the space to do a large group training, you know? So what are, what's another uh, one or two other hard fought lessons you you've kind of come away with from the last six years? Uh, no side deals. No, if you like someone and they're a buddy, um, um, that's something that I'm a people pleaser in, uh, by nature. And I always want to be like, I can hook you up and, uh, but everyone's got to do the same thing because once you give someone a deal, then all of a sudden their buddy's going to be like, Hey, Mike offered me this, or Mike offered me this. Um, and, uh, we make sure that we, we keep it black and white. We make sure that this is what you're getting. This is, you know, the pricing, this is, et cetera. Um, and go from there. I mean, that's a mistake. Did you get, did you get kicked in the teeth in that some, at some point? Well, yeah, you know, we were making side deals. We're trying to do people favors because it was early on in our, our, uh, our, in our ownership. And we thought that, well, Hey man, this will really help us. And it always comes back to bite us in the butt. And, uh, you know, there's been, there's been a few things that we've done in the past that we kind of goofed up. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things that we really goofed up on is, uh, you know, make sure that when you are, you know, working with potential, uh, you know, potential, potential clients or customers, and you're going through like your contract and your training agreement, I literally read like every single line verbatim to them and have them initial it because I always tell them, Hey, I want you to know what you're signing. And I always explain it to them in a way that like, Hey, you know, and I'll even give them a scenario. Like hey, if, you know, we, you know, cause we offer, um, you can, if you have a year membership, we offer the ability to pause. Uh, for a medical reason. And I explained to them like, Hey, if there's a medical reason why you cannot legitimately get here, we can pause your membership. But you know, if you, you know, if you, you know, rolled your ankle and you know, you need to maybe take a few days off um, and, and stay away from lower body, we can make those changes for you. So get your butt back in the gym and start training. Mm-hmm. So those are the things that we, uh, we always try to do as far as, you know, really being crystal clear on contracts and training agreements. Um, you can never be, uh, you can never be too clear 
when it comes to those training scenarios. And um, well, the fact that you have contracts puts you in an elite, what 25% of the industry that just, you know, at, at best it was written on the back of a cocktail napkin. You guys sounds like you're actually going through it with the client. I was surprised we had a contract with a person and they signed up and all of a sudden they're like, I need a refund or something. I'm like, what are you talking about? And uh, just, you know, the, the, they were asking to violate the contract and, I just don't know why, because it, it didn't, it didn't make sense with the person who was asking for that. And then we found out, oh, they're, you know, they're getting a divorce and they're under some undue stress, but it was weird that they were asking to break a contract. You're like, this doesn't make any sense. And why would you do that? Cause it, it's in fact a contract, like we're going to provide this and you provide that, you know? Yeah. And, and, and like we tell people, um, and, and it's, as we've grown and as we've, you know, got more members, we seem to run in this a little bit more and more. I mean, you know, some people sign up for a year and then after like seven months, they're like, I want to cancel. And it's like, well, okay, cool. But here's a copy of your contract. We send them it. This is what you signed. This is what you agreed to. Here are your options. You can continue and this is what you'll end up paying or this is your cancellation fee. And, and I think for some reason, when you have a small business, people think it's, you know, you're maybe because they see you on a daily basis and they think, oh, they're just a nice person. But, um, and be like, hey, you know, we paid you for like the last four or five months. Can you give us a month off? They'd be like, hell no. But for some reason, when you own a gym, people think as if it's just like a fun thing we do. Meanwhile, it's like, this is, this is how I feed my family. This is how I pay my bills. So sure. um, it, it's one of those things that you always have to educate people on. And uh, it's, it's just very odd. I mean, we've had some really, <laughs> some really funny scenarios where someone's like, hey, I didn't come, you know, for the last month I was busy. Can I get a refund? And I'm like, no, you can't get a refund because you didn't show up. Like, you know, that's like me. When you go on vacation, your mortgage company doesn't let, give you a break on paying for it, right? Like, exactly. Or I always use this scenario. Listen, I'm not going to order a pizza, have it delivered, eat half of the pizza, and then call the place back and be like, hey, listen, I only ate half of this. Can you give me a refund for the remaining half? Like, it just makes zero sense. But for some reason, people think that that is an acceptable thing to do with, uh, with, with gym memberships. And then the funny thing is then they get mad at you when you ask them to hold up to the contract that they signed and agreed to. It's very interesting. And there are scenarios you just have to let it go and let it slide because it's just not worth your time. But, um, you know, we've, we've had to use a lawyer sometimes. And, um, because again, it's, it's just something that if, if people are bullies and there's a lot of people out there that are bullies and they, they think they can walk all over you. Sometimes you just have to do the right thing. You have to do the, the, the best thing for your business. And that's just standing your ground. It's not being a jerk. It's just, you know, if you let everybody do whatever they want, what's the point of having contracts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the only thing. Uh, it's the only thing you got. And by the way, if you ever get valuated by a bank or you want to borrow money or anything, what they usually ask for is what kind of contracts do you have and what kind of uh, monthly recurring revenue and how much of that revenue is on contract. So the contract doesn't just protect you that way. It also gives you access to other things because the bank realizes that's the only business there is. Like if there's no contract, people just drift off in the middle of the night and you can't do anything about it. So in yeah. the end, don't, don't freaking live without contracts is what I'm saying. Yeah. And it's funny because I have a, a client of mine and he owns eight or 10 large gyms in the area. And, uh, he's, he's a, he's a nice guy. He's a hard worker, very successful guy, but he's almost like a little, like, yeah. What's that movie when Clint Eastwood, when he's, <laughs> he's just, uh, he's Grand like Torino. yeah, he's total. He's got a little Clint Eastwood and Gran Torino in him. You could tell he's just a little calloused and he's, you know, he's seen too much and he's just like, you know, he's got funny stories, but you know, you can tell like he just gets a little calloused about those sort of things because he has to deal with this stuff. I mean, he's got, hundreds of thousands of members. So for him, it's just like another, uh, here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, at this point he doesn't let something like a contractual thing just bother him. He just kind of does what he has. To. Yeah. Uh, I think at a certain point you have to, you have to get used to the fact that, Hey, you may, you know, you may get some people upset with you, but that's just part of running a business. So you're saying that your, your client, uh, he, he, has seen it all and done it all with contracts. Uh, but what advice did he give you? He just said, Hey, he's like, you're sticking to your guns, but also be okay with every once in a while having to just cut people off and just say, see you later. Yeah. It stinks. Especially when you're a great coach. Cause you spend a lot of time with these people, you know, multiple days a week and whatnot, but 
you got to have the guts to do it. So, well, that's good advice. Uh, yeah, any other tips fun. you got, you it's, got for our people from a business standpoint, um, keep your gym clean, man. Keep your bathrooms clean. <laughs> like it sounds silly. Um, but people don't want to dump something that you're, you're take, taking good care of your, and I would also say, um, you know, one thing that's helped us tremendously with our clientele is like at the end of personal training sessions and at the end of classes, just be like, Hey guys, can you help me put everything away? And can you help me, you know, put up, put away the dumbbells and kettlebells and ropes. And, and I think when you start to introduce that early, um, I just think people, people aren't going to be like, no, right. They're not going to be like, no, I'm not going to help you put away the dumbbells I just used. So I think if you can actually get your clients on board with just cleaning up and, um, you know, getting the place organized, I think it goes a long way. And I think it's important to do that because you don't want to sit there at the end of the night being like, what happened in here? It looks like a bomb went off. So and they get that's, some ownership uh, above the space right. too, right? They, they feel good about helping because they look at it as their own at that point. You go after that higher level of client and that's all free profit. I mean, if, if all it takes is cleaning your gym to get an extra 50 bucks a month out of somebody, why not do it? Yeah. And, and I think a lot of business owners think that maybe they're over that or they're above that, but I can't tell you how many years, um, we, you know, I was cleaning the toilets a couple of days a week and just getting in there. And, you know, I mean, I did it and our company did it for almost five years where we did it ourselves. And then finally we got to a point where we said, Hey, we're going to invest in hiring a cleaner. So um, that was just a decision that we made that, Hey, you know, that time spent can be used for other things. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you giving everybody these tips, especially these business tips, because I know they're coming from a guy who spent a lot of time in the trenches is there every day running fitness. So for those folks who uh, maybe want have some questions, would you mind if they reach out to you? No, not, not, not at all. So, um, you can reach me, uh, on Facebook at Mike Perry. Um, there's probably several of those, but you'll probably see a picture of a couple of cute blonde kids. Those are my, my boys, um, on Instagram. Um, it's coach Mike Perry. Um, our gym is skill of strength. You can find us on uh, Facebook and on, uh, Instagram as well. And if you want to email me personally, um, it's Mike at skill of strength.com. Awesome. All right. Well, I appreciate that. And hopefully people reach out with some good questions and, or maybe come by when they're in the Boston area. Cause, uh, I know that you, I, I can't describe how beautiful his gym is for the most non-traditional looking gym ever, but it's awesome. I mean, it's just, it's gorgeous. So, uh, hopefully somebody can stop by and see it in person. Absolutely. We're going to be actually hosting an FMS level one here in September. So, uh, if you're interested in, you know, attending an FMS course, um, we're going to be on, uh, you can check out functionalmovementsystems.com or functionalmovement.com. And, um, we are in, uh, North Chelmsford and our gym is a uh, skill of strength. So hopefully, um, we can see some of you guys there. Awesome. All right, Mike. Well, thank you very much for the time today. Uh, everybody listening, this is Dr. Josh Satterley from Mike Perry saying, Go out there, maximize your license, and live the life you dream of. Thank you, Mike. All right, Josh. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Clinic Gym Radio. If you're ready to double your profit without working longer hours, please visit clinicgymhybrid.com and find out how easy it is to get started on your path to freedom. That's clinicgymhybrid.com.